Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. All right, so this is Asia Tech Podcast 370. My name is Graham Brown, joined today as ever by Michael Waits. Michael, how are you doing? I am doing super, Graham. How are you doing today? Fantastic. It a little bit of a break. Like a little bit of a break from the tour. <laughs> yeah, but still going, but just a little bit of a break. Breathe we will up. get there. And more interviews, more recordings. We've been so busy doing these Asia Tech podcast stories. That's what we want to talk about this evening. Something a little bit different for you guys today. I want to share some insights of what we've been up to in the last week. And some of the, well, I suppose the word inspiring is the, what we've got to talk about here. Some of the stories we share. I mean, you know, this is what it's about. It's sharing the stories of these startup founders, investors, entrepreneurs, and so on. You know, this is the seed that gets planted in people's heads that makes change in their lives, right? And one of the, the reasons they make change is they hear what somebody else has done with their lives and importantly, how they've overcome challenges. So that's one of the things we want to talk about tonight, isn't it? Success outside the comfort zone. Why do yeah, we want to talk that, about that? Isn't, isn't it that phrase you said? What is it? Success is what is measured by, how does it go? I'll never get that right. I think you said that to me earlier, right? Success is measured by like the moment you get outside your comfort zone. Oh, life zone. begins at the end of your comfort zone, right? Yeah, it really does, though. I really think exactly. so. And I think, why do we want to talk about it? I think we want to talk about it if we can be you know, humble enough to say. I think both of us actually have a little bit of that in us as well. Yeah. Michael is right. not from Thailand, even though he lives there. Let's start with that story. What's your, what's your story, Michael, outside the comfort zone? I know people don't realize this about you. I mean, when they hear you or when they talk to you, they kind of think that you're a recent arrival in Asia, but you've been in Asia since, well, I don't know, well, since the last millennium, right? So what's the story? <laughs> since the millennium falcon. Um, <laughs> look, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really important, right? Um, and I think necessity actually also is a great way for entrepreneurs to get started, right? They need something. They need to develop something. Um, and I always say that pe there's a fallacy that people have that – and there are a few of these fallacies. One of them is that everyone that you meet is like a delta of three or four years around your age. Otherwise, how would you meet them, right? They're doing the same things you're doing. The other fallacy is that the person you meet today is the same person they've always been their whole lives, right? So if you meet somebody in abject poverty, they must have been in abject poverty their whole lives. They wouldn't have had any ups and downs. And if you meet somebody who's very successful, the idea is that the fallacy is that they've always been very successful. They never had to work for everything that they had. They just kind of were born into a successful life and just sort of meditated on that successful life. And I think the reality is that none of that's true, mm. right? And I think for both of us, I think we have stories that go well beyond what people probably know about us. And I think it gives us a good perspective when we talk to other people to try to understand their stories, which is the whole reason why I think we've been able to be so prolific about, you know, getting people to talk to us and to open up to us when we mm -hmm. talk to them and learning about, excuse me, learning about their individual stories. You know, I made a really interesting decision when I was in college, and that was to, instead of going to France and studying French or doing what most kids were doing back in 1984, I decided that I was going to study Japanese in college and spend my junior year abroad, which is a lot of American students were doing it back then. I was just going to spend my junior year abroad in, in Japan. And that just was not the normal thing to do. And for me, it was a differentiating way into graduation to be able to get a job. It turns out that job was in global finance. But for me, it was always doing something that was different than everybody else was doing and also trying to do something that was more difficult, right? The, the idea is that in 19, you know, when I was in high school, when I was in college, everybody was studying some sort of romance language, right? Whether mm. it was Italian or French or Spanish. And, you know, I used to say that back then the kids that really had no drive, like went to London for their year abroad or their mm. semester abroad. Safe, because, right. Yeah, I mean, it's not that London wasn't culturally different, but it was just English. And once you had the language, like getting around, you know, where's the toilet? How do I get from here to there? You get on a bus and you get lost. Like that stuff's easy. But if you end up in Taiwan or you end up in, you know, <clears throat> Nanjing, if you did that, or if you end up in Tokyo, like, and I was in Kyoto, actually, just getting around and figuring things out back then when international travel was not as prevalent and just like struggling through that process – for the rest of your life, actually, is super beneficial. I think what we'll find out when we talk when we talk to the people that populate our stories platform is that they've pretty much done a similar thing. Yeah. Right. And if you listen to at least in sort of 
abbreviated and abridged form, you know, I, I graduated from college and I worked in New York for a couple of years, but I went right to Tokyo. And when, when did you in arrive to- in Tokyo? February 20th, 1990. 99, and you, wow. And you cannot make it up. And I remember landing there and just looking around and thinking, you know, when I was in college, it was always a goal of mine to kind of get a job and work in Tokyo, but I never thought it would be at that level. And if I told you that I was going to be working at Morgan Stanley and then later working at Goldman Sachs, I think I would have surprised myself, right. frankly. Put it into context as well, Michael, 1990, very different from today where, I mean, everybody's going to Japan now. It's like the destination. Everybody knows Japan now. Everybody's tasted sushi. Everybody's seen Japan on the internet. And it's not, it's not anything like what it was back in 1990 before the internet. It was still very mysterious. People didn't speak Japanese. Nobody had eaten sushi in 1990, right? So it's a very it was- different world. It was completely different. And like you said, the internet has meant that, you know, so much information about not just Japan, but about the rest of the world travels back and forth so that people aren't surprised anymore. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine today about this, right? Maps, the idea of maps on the internet Mm. has literally changed people's sort of sense of adventure, right? No longer do you kind of walk up to a map on the street and say, Oh, here it says you are here. And there's like a wooden map, like on a post, on a signpost somewhere. And then you figure out how to get somewhere. There's that, that sense of excitement and joy of struggling to find like that small restaurant in a small town, you know, or outside of a small city that you read about somewhere in a book or that your friend told you about when you were in college. Like that struggle to find that is gone because all you do is type it into TripAdvisor mm. and it's there. But I think this, the same thing is true about the information for places, right? It's like, when I went to Tokyo, um, one of the things that the company provided for me was they provided free international calls because making an international call was so expensive mm. that if I wanted to just call my mom and dad or my brother, I would not have been able to afford it myself. It was just so expensive. And today, you can literally get off the plane, get onto Wi-Fi or get onto sort of local data package and get on Skype immediately. And then send a picture of yourself to Instagram, you know, put up some stuff on WeChat if you're, if you're talking to somebody. Like, it's just so different. And it meant that you were isolated. And I think that's one of the things that an entrepreneur feels like a lot is a little bit of a sense of isolation. I'm out here doing this alone. And that, that sense of doing something alone, I think, is really important. But, but again, that struggle is, I think, what separates the desire to struggle, to do things outside right. your comfort zone, is what makes – is what differentiates someone who's going to succeed as an entrepreneur and who isn't going to succeed as an entrepreneur because that's where all the excitement is. Mm. No? Yeah, it's the choice to put yourself in that position, right? Choose the so. struggle, right? Because I think that's the what makes you dig deeper into yourself and find something which you didn't have before. You know, that's one of the, the big learning processes about moving to a new country. And this is the thing we want to talk about this evening. Asia Tech Podcast. I mean, Michael's just giving you his story about moving to Japan. 1990, right? Yeah, 1990. Before the internet. I moved to Japan in Michael's footsteps, no doubt, in 1996, which if you do the math, actually I was younger than Michael, so I can score a point there. But I came in 96, which is actually, again, it's before the internet. We had no clue about what it was like. Again, it was just, you may have seen some programs on TV, but you couldn't just go to the internet and look at something. It was all, I remember I, I, I had a friend who came to Tokyo before me a year before and he sent me a, a letter and that's how I found out about, in an envelope, <laughs> right. right? In one yeah, of those, yeah, I don't know if you remember, the, right, those airmail letters which you could actually write inside the envelope itself. The envelope became the actual letter because they, so, they were so cheap to send because airmail was still expensive back there. And that's how I found out about Japan. He sent me one of these and told me what was going on, right? And you yeah. receive one of these every six months. So I came to Japan in 96. And I think, again, like yourself, choosing to put yourself in that position of struggle. Because it's what, I don't know, it, it's, it's something that which mentally I think we get off on because there's challenges there, right? You start as a beginner and you end up somehow mastering something. And, and sometimes when you do master something, you want to move on to something new, right? A new struggle. Because yeah. that keeps us alive. And that's the thing that we want to talk about with these ATP stories because we've had some great stories this week and want to share them and let's talk about those Michael because I think 
you know, we talk about the content, we talk about AI and AR and fintech, medtech and so on. But I think the key here is the actual stories themselves, what the human stories behind the technology, the people who bring that technology to the show and share their stories with us. We've had some really inspiring examples of struggle. So let's go. Yeah. There. Let's do that. I just want to make one point, if, unless my math is wrong. If you arrived in 1996 <laughs> and I arrived in 1990, it meant that you and I were pretty much the same age. Oh, is that right? I think it might be a Approximately year. Approximately <laughs> a year apart, but I mean, it's close enough. And I think that's actually interesting in the sense right. that like, we were in our early to mid-20s. And isn't that the time when people kind of make a decision to kind of yeah. you know, go the road less traveled, for lack, of a better, for lack of a better phrase, and just say, I'm not going to do what everybody else does. And the rest of my life is going to be spent doing things that not everybody else is doing. But yeah, you're right. So where do you want to start? With let's, all, let's, just, let's just talk about some of the people that we've yeah, spoken to recently, do. right? Right. Let's do, start at the top. Marty Roberts, again. Well, well, let's continue this theme. Marty Roberts, CEO of NTouch. Amazing interview because he, he's a guy who – could have become or did become a clinical psychologist. And that is a long process in the US, right? A long professional career track, which you know is laid out for you. A lot of qualifications to get, training, do your residency and so on. And you know, when people take that path, it's an investment of time and money. Not a lot of people step outside of that path, and you've got to have a very, very big reason to step outside of that and do something else. So he, here's a guy who left the U.S., moved to Japan again, and went to work for a Japanese-French company in the research and pharmaceutical space, started as an analyst. So, you know, you've gone from being, like, the king of your castle, because if you're, you know, a trained clinical psychologist, you, you know, you are the boss of your own world, right? Yeah. And then to go and become an analyst, which is effectively starting at the ground floor of one of these organizations, right? Where you don't speak French, you don't speak Japanese, you know, you really are thrown at the deep end and then work his way up through this company through for 10 years, right? And eventually end up as the president of the company. Yeah, and think about this too, right? It wasn't like he was in the middle of med school or whatever when he decided to do this. If you go back and look at his credentials, he started getting a bachelor's degree in psychology in 1996, and he finished his PhD in clinical and in clinical psychology in 2005. Exactly. That's a 10-year ten, yeah. commitment. That's lo really long. We talk about this, right? That's a 10-year commitment to doing one thing and then at the end going, you know what? I'm switching gears. Right. That, must that take in and of itself, right? yeah. huge bravery. I mean, think just think about yourself when you got on that plane, right, to go from home to Tokyo. I am sure that some of your friends and your family thought you were crazy. Yep. Right. And at the beginning, they probably asked you, "When are you coming home? When, right, when right, is this yeah. little interlude? When is this interlude, <laughs> interlude going to be finished?" Interlude is the word. It's like a phase, isn't it? Okay, right. You've just had a your phase. Fun. You've had your fun. <laughs> Right. And now you come home. But think about what Marty must have gone through. Right. Ten years. And yeah. I bet I would be willing to bet. I don't know this, but I wouldn't be surprised. Actually, I'm not sure if I'd bet it, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were at least one or two other people in his yeah. family who either A, are doctors, B, have a PhD yep. or C, like sacrificed something along the way or supported him or helped him out. Even if just emotionally to help him get like go through to get a PhD, a PhD is a non-trivial event, right? It's so mm -hmm. hard to do, and yet here he was going, "That's great, I get my PhD at Hofstra, I'm out of here." Right, and that makes but it even harder, does that doesn't it? You know, way harder. The key part of all of these stories, isn't it? It's not just the the challenge which individuals have taken on. They've got to remember that we have to remember if you're a startup founder, you know, you are connected to a whole bunch of people who could be friends and family who might not get it. Or, you know, the classic example, I don't know Marty's background. I can't remember from the story. We didn't touch on it too much. But as you said, somebody who goes into the medical profession often has a parent or an uncle or somebody like that who once was or is a doctor or a medical technician or whatever. And they don't get that. I'm sure it's hard for them to see that, you know, you've got a very comfortable, well-paying job and then your son or your nephew or whoever then goes and becomes an entrepreneur. Yeah, that and must I mean, be it's hard. also, it's really hard, right? Because it's also the case that like, like I said, even if they're not doctors, becoming a doctor 
I think in probably every country, whether it's becoming a doctor or maybe an engineer, right? Yeah. Your family's proud of you. You know, when exactly. Marty was finishing up his PhD, I'm pretty sure his mom and dad were like, look at my son getting his PhD in clinical psych. Did you, where did he go? Uh, you know what I mean? They're just like, what happened? Where did he go? Exactly. He went to, he went to Japan. So, <laughs> of all places you know as I mean, well. Right? I mean, you know, like Japan of all places, it's like, you know, even here now in 2017, doctors outrank being a startup founder in terms of cool, you know, being a startup founder is like an alternative lifestyle. You know, why do you want to do that? You could be a doctor. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think everybody gets that. Right. right. So for him to go and do that, particularly after spending all of that time yeah. and, you know, all of that effort to go and do it, I think it says something about what it's like and what he feels like to, you know, go out and strike out on his own. But he did more than that. Right. Right. So like after, Starting at this company as an analyst, he worked his way all the way up to being what? The president, president. and the representative. Yep. And the representative director of a company in Japan is so hard to do yep. for, for a foreigner for sure to get that high in any, com in any company in Japan. Um, and then he switched gears again. And then to leave and become a, a startup founder, to set up his own thing. You know, to go and start a business aimed at the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry. You know, that is tough because you, you're dealing with a very, very large machine and many, many working parts, right? And it's a machine yeah. not, not open to change readily, right? Not really. You have, to be, you have to accept you're coming from the outside, right? And that's the key. That's the key theme. So I think, you know, for somebody who gets that at a young age to be able to survive in those environments, and it's something I don't know if you can teach it, but, you know, to be, grow up in those environments. And we talk about this between you and I, Michael, about, you know, our kids, right? Yeah, it's like it, you just grow up with that feeling and that sort of cultural. What's the word I'm looking for? But that sort of cultural experience where you can survive without having to attach yourself to a specific identity or a specific group of people or a specific hometown right. or a specific way of doing things. And you know, okay, that's fine for growing up and for lifestyle. But then put that into business, it works as well. You right. know, you can then well, survive in an area where you don't have a track to run on or there aren't any rules, right? Right, and you don't know you don't know what the local rules are. You don't know what the existing rules are. Look, I used to say, you know, because I started this journey so long ago that I don't even think there was the term third culture kid when I left the United States when I was twenty four years old. And I always feel like I'm a third culture adult because hmm. you know, just like you know, just like my daughter and just like your son, they're growing up in a bunch of different places. So maybe the first place where they existed was their home, whatever that means. But because they move around and they're not moving, you know, like I did when I was a kid, they're not moving from, you know, Connecticut to New Jersey or New Jersey to Connecticut. They're moving from Europe to an island somewhere. <laughs> and then they're moving from there back to, you know, Spain. And then they're moving to Japan. And for a child, it can go two ways, right? It can either be traumatic, like, oh, my God, there's no stability in my life or, oh, my God, my life's an adventure. And I think from a third culture kid perspective, most of them look at this like, Life is an adventure. And if you look at the list of people that we've spoken to over the past week, and I think it's sort of indicative of the people to whom we speak anyway, they look at life as an adventure. You yeah. can't do that. You can't think about life in a different way unless you, you cannot be a great entrepreneur, right? Unless you think about life in that way, because otherwise you're just bogged down by the safety of what you can the lose, existing. Yeah. As, yeah, the safety. Of, yeah, exactly. Of what you can lose as opposed to your ability to go out and seek what's new. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I mean, it's a great, it's a classic example with Marty's story where, you know, somebody had a lot to lose, but let's sort of go to the other extreme as well. Now let's talk about Jacob or Jakob. Yeah. You know, you know him quite well. He's got, he's got a fascinating story because I mean, I think he's very different in terms of the background to Marty, but I think the direction they're heading is very similar, isn't it? So let's talk about his story. Yeah. I mean, look, in the end, you know, I'll call him Jacob just because that's what I've always – that's how I've always addressed him, right? But, you know, you're talking about a guy who literally left home when he was very young, right? I don't remember the exact age he was. I don't want to call him a kid because I think it's slightly pejorative. But let's just say he was very young, and I'm sure that he went through some of the same things that Marty went through just at a different level, right? Because he was much younger when he did it. Where are you going? Mm. And what are you going to do when you get there? Right, because your background before you arrive is essentially nothing. Yep. Right. So you've just graduated from school and you're just gonna 
sort of venture out into the big world. Maybe you've done a little bit of work, but maybe not. And you're just going to venture out into the world, into a place where you've never been before. And then you're going to figure out a way to exist, right? So Jacob started a couple of companies here. The first one was PageMoto, right? right, right. And PageMoto... It's a, give a bit of background. So people know he, he left Denmark and moved to Bangkok, right? So Right, right. I'm not sure there are two places that are as diametrically opposed <laughs> or, or as different as those two places. You know, but again, to be fair, you're moving from a very homogeneous country into another homogeneous country, but the second one of which is where you, like, you stick out. I mean, I know I do here, and I know you do where you are, but that concept right. of, like, not being the same as everybody else around you, whether the people around you care or not, right? You notice it, and you notice it in a way that um, that you wouldn't notice at home, right? But Page Moto was this business that was that was sort of Facebook centered. It was back in the day when things like Zingo were still really huge, like Facebook oh. gaming was really big, right? And he built a business with a co-founder that did Facebook marketing. It basically helped anybody. Before Facebook was a platform for business, he figured out this is an easy and quick way for people to get online and run their businesses there. And actually, he ran that business for a couple of years and sold it, right? Right. which was great. I mean, if you think about somebody starting a business and selling a business at that age and that quickly back then, particularly with the environment, people forget that like back in 2010, 2011 in Bangkok, the startup scene wasn't what it is today. Yeah, yeah. It didn't and, exist. And us, right. not, not really. Not really. Like I think 2012 was the tipping point, again, for lack of a better term. But Jacob was one of the pioneers with his partners as well, Tomas, right? And right. you know, once they built that business, once he built this business and sold that business, you know, I don't think these – I don't think when you're, you live sort of an adventure-style life, you're ever comfortable, if that makes sense. Yep. Right? But what is you – know, what do you do next? How do I sort of surpass myself? And again, you go out into the unknown. And once you've done it, like that sense of going out into the unknown gets easier in relative terms, but it's never easy. And I think they sort of tried to figure out what they wanted to do. Yeah. And, and I mean, maybe you can fill in some of the gaps for me. I have, I have a few other stories that I want to tell about Jacob that he's told to me over time. But like, you know, you basically, he had this company Play Lab, which was a mobile gaming company, right? It used to be called Pocket Play Lab because you put the phones in your pocket but PlayLab, in the end, had 28 million clients. It employed 100 yep. people. This was a real big business that essentially these two created out of thin air. Okay? That's amazing. And again, in an environment where they weren't local, they weren't native, and it was you know miles and miles and miles away from home. That level of discomfort that you have, even after a little bit of success, is still there, I think, in almost all cases. Like that that's a pretty amazing story from my perspective. That's the driver, isn't it? I think the interesting thing about Jacob's story is, I mean, he talks about this in his, his interview on ATP. He talks about where his, sort of the genesis of his entrepreneurial drive came from. And one of the stories he tells is about, um, I think, as I remember correctly, the school was throwing out old cables, from and they were tossing out these cables into the you know these skips where they would get you know taken away and disposed of but Jacob realized these cables were made of copper but you know they were coated by the plastic coating so if you strip the sure. plastic off you could get copper right and you know lots and lots of copper to a, a teenager is is cash right yeah so the story he tells is he he worked out that first of all he could sell this stuff and then he secondly he worked out that he could employ so to speak his classmates to strip the plastic off these copper cables right that's awesome i did not know that that is awesome <laughs> go ahead. sorry go ahead but I, I love these kind of stories it's kind of like the lemonade stand type story isn't it but it's sort of that's the raw hustle of an entrepreneur we talk about this whole idea of being comfortable with being uncomfortable right but i think that is core to it that's the happy sort of like partner of that is is this hustle that these people can spot opportunity they can make money out of effectively anything and you know they always kind of land on their feet so i love those stories those are the kind of entrepreneurs that resonate more with my kind of like way of building business right right but again you make a really interesting point right he took something that other people are throwing away it was garbage Right, and this is actually the classic story. And he said, I, I don't see it as garbage. I see it as an opportunity. And not only did he see it as an opportunity for himself, but he saw it as an opportunity to employ his right. friends and classmates. That is <laughs> insanely good. 
but the one thing, so the one thing that I think about Jacob, right, that I'll never get away from unless he proves me wrong, is that he seems to be, in the words of Wayne Gretzky, like skating to where the puck is going right, yeah, right. to be, not to where, not to where it is. And again, I like that phrase because it really defines him well in the sense that he's been very good at looking at a market, the overall market, and for a guy who can do pretty much anything he wants, right? Because if everything to you looks like an opportunity, mm. then you're being really good at this means you're eliminating all the things that you don't think are going to work and trying to choose the one where you think you'll be most successful. Not necessarily that's the biggest opportunity, but where you'll have the most success. Mm. Right. So he did that with Page Moto, sold that. He saw the mobile game business, right? When everybody else, and I know this because I made this mistake, when everybody else was fo- focusing on Facebook games, he said mobile is going to be the thing. And I'm going to ignore this place where everybody is mm. today, which is Facebook games, and I'm going right to mobile because that's where the market's going to be for everything. And I think in the gaming space is the place where I'm going to have the most impact. And he just went and did it. And it worked really well. Not only was that company invested by one of the premier um, venture capitalists in Southeast Asia, but it was also sold to one of the fastest growing e-commerce companies in Southeast Asia, which was announced about mm. probably a month ago now, right? You know that because it was in the interview probably when you spoke to him. Yep. Um, <clears throat> that's amazing. But what it means to me is now Jacob has committed himself in a new business called Like Studios, right? Like is just a shortened version of his middle to last name. And he's now focusing on augmented reality. It means to me that so two things. One is he feels like that's the market where he personally is going to be most successful. But also, it tells me that that, that opportunity from a pure market perspective is right. large enough for him to focus his energy. And that, to me, is fascinating. Right? So that's like just the ongoing value of that story. And this is one of the reasons why we do this. Right? This is why we go out and seek these people out for ATP stories, for Asia Tech Bud test stories. And that's because – there's so many nuggets in here mm. for each one of these people to learn about like what it really takes to go out, find the right business opportunity, just find a way to live that's different as an entrepreneur than the way most other people live. And that's really interesting about this, I think. No? Yeah, yeah. And they, they come in different forms, don't they? And that, that's the key part here is that this story is told in many different ways. But the, the heroes of the story, so to speak, whether it's Jacob or Marty, very different backgrounds. So the key why I think we go out and find different stories and different types of people is that people will relate to different stories. Like you may hear the Marty story and think, well, that's me. Or you may hear the Jacob story and think that, well, that's me. But you know, the core spirit of that story is often very similar. And it's this story of somebody who's taken the step to step outside of the comfort zone and succeed in this area where, you know, they start from zero effectively, but the people who do it, you know, there's many different ways you can relate. And that's why we're out there finding different people for this. And that sort of brings us to the next part. Right. And is the, per- Anna's the perfect example of this, right? Exactly. Anna Gong, right? Who's now the CEO and the chairman, I think, of Perks Technologies. So they run a business called Get Perks. And, you know, when Anna came into this business, it looked very different than what it looks like today, two or three years in. But again, what she did up until that point is also indicative of the way she's going to behave when she gets inside that company, right? So Anna, you know, when she graduated from UCLA back in the day, went into a management consulting business, right? Mm-hmm. And But she was so close because she was in Los Angeles. I think her first job was also in San Francisco. She's sitting in San Francisco, like back in the late 90s, early 2000s, watching the first, you know, dot-com crash, but mm-hmm. also still with one eye outside of her, her sort of <clears throat> big corporate job, and her business-to-business or enterprise software-style sales job with one eye sort of looking off to the left or off to the right and thinking there's an entire startup community that's developing out Mm. there. And all of the skills that I'm building here internally are likely to be really um, applicable to what's going on out there. Right? Again, a different journey, a different Mm. way into it, but constantly looking like, I think I may be able to do this and I think I may be able to do that. I want to do something different. But again, you know, an Asian woman, and I'll just say it straight out, like an Asian woman, right, there's a perception around like where she's from, which is not. She's from the United States, right? So she's, again, doing something that people think is not exactly who she is and what she should be doing. And she's done nothing but excel in all of those places, which is, again, truly amazing. And ended up being, you know, the international sales manager, the head of all international expansion for a couple of different companies, you know, including a really large company called Computer Associates, which, again, when she was there, 
was a KA company, a kick-ass company mm. that was, you know, building some really great stuff. But again, for her to get from where she was to there meant that she must have been outperforming everybody along the way. And sure, you know, Anna is a super lady and she'll tell you that, you know, there were mentors and supporters along the way. And, you know, we know no one succeeds alone, but the bottom line is that it takes a really special person outside of a comfort zone, right? Most of her colleagues were probably not like she was. And for her to succeed and excel at that level meant she was set up perfectly for being in a new business and a startup business in Singapore, mm. right? So she ends up in Singapore and, you know, ends up working at this company. You know, she she was doing some stuff in Singapore first for other big companies and then gets lured into the Perks Technologies business with Get Perks. This was a pure business to consumer business. How can I get a consumer right to download my application, to use that application to go into a coffee shop or, you know, an SME and then use it to get perks, right? How do I get the benefits and the loyalty points that build up so I can get that free cup of coffee or the extra pack of gum or, or you know, the free Coke when I order this dinner, that type of thing. And she said it always felt like that that side of the business was really difficult because getting consumers to do anything on their own is really hard, particularly in a world that, <clears throat> you know, if you look back when she joined back in 2014, everybody was developing an app and the the ability to get someone to download a new application that was just that was bespoke onto their phone, whether it was Android or iOS, was always going to be really hard, mm. right? And she said, wait a second, what is my experience? Well, I have enterprise experience. What does that mean? That means that in big corporations, big corporations also provide benefits and loyalty points and parts to their, to their employees. Maybe the better way to do this is B to B to C. And she went out to her investors and out to her board and said, let's change the focus of this company from trying to go get individual businesses to deal with us to getting the biggest corporations to deal with us. And then that's where all the users are naturally. And you see a paradigm change in the way that business was built. But again, it takes its risk on so many different levels for her because, you know, she took over from the original founder. So she wasn't the original founder of the business. There's always risk in doing that too. The business had been around for three or four, maybe four or five years when she joined. So again, there's an embedded mentality and an embedded feeling inside that company of this is the way we do things. Even small companies have this, right? This is where we've always done it kind of feeling. She changed that too and then got people on board across the board and then went out and started doing sales mm. to large corporations, which is something that she'd done before. But it's very different, right? And I know this from you know, sitting in a seat at Goldman Sachs, you think it's you, right? You think you're the person who's calling the client and convincing them to have right, some yeah, sort yeah. of relationship with your business, which happens to be a Goldman Sachs. And the reality is that Goldman knows this better than you do. They'll tell you that seat's worth a, a certain amount of money, regardless of who's sitting in it. A monkey could sit in that seat and still generate X hundred thousand dollars of revenue. It's your job to you know quadruple that or sextuple that, whatever it is, because anybody that sits there can do that thing. But for what Anna was doing, and again, making a sea change in the way that business was, there was no given, mm. right? And the sales cycle is very different. When you go into a corporation, while the payoff could be 1,000 or 2,000 downloads or employees on your platform, the reality is that <clears throat> that could be a five to seven month, you know, in general, a six month sales cycle. And that is really hard work. And remember, she's doing this, like we said, outside your comfort zone. She's doing it in a country where she's not native, where she hasn't lived, mm. may not understand at its core sort of all the local customs. She had been there a couple of years. But again, taking a small company and making it key to part of a big company's operations and providing benefits to them, it literally flipped her entire company on its head. And then to go out and succeed and grow is nothing short of amazing, I think. Yeah. There's a really interesting theme here, isn't there, about sales here? And I want to explore that a little bit if we can. It's tell like, me, tell me. Well, you know, sales often gets a, a bad rap. And I think one of the reasons is, is people feel that, you know, their experience of sales is they walk into a retail store and there's a young guy, at, you know, helping them try on shirts or jeans or whatever. That's their experience of sales or, or people phoning them up, trying to sell them, you know, life assurance or windows, right? That's what people assume sales is. 
But, you know, so when they go into the working world, they want to leave sales behind. That's, you know, I want to become, you know, I want to get into this area. And sales is what the entry level people do. But real entrepreneurs sell. And it seems that, you know, that's the core here, isn't it? That a lot of these people have had history in sales. And whether that be like with Anna's example, like in enterprise sales or Jacob, you know, direct selling himself he was the salesman of the organization right that hustle or even marty you know his experience is saying you know he works with field sales reps right yeah and i feel i find it fascinating isn't it i find that if i was to invest in a startup i would always want to know who the sales guy of the organization is you know it's if you've got two guys building stuff who's the guy selling the stuff right yeah you've got to know and when I used to recruit people in my old company years ago, I always used to look at their sales experience and no matter what they would do in the organization because they wouldn't fit in otherwise. You know, I want to see, have they worked in retail? Did they, you know, spend a summer selling and did they pick something up from that? That's a real entrepreneur, I feel. Somebody who can sell and people are scared of selling and I think, they get, you know, it gets a bad rap for the wrong reason. And you know, you were a trader, right? In your previous life. Yeah, we did a lot of sales, though, as well, right? Right. That, well, yeah, exactly. That's kind of the sales mindset, isn't it? And I think that's core to success as an entrepreneur, to be able to sell. Well, it super is because you're, like I said, if you sit in a seat at Goldman Sachs or at Merrill Lynch or whatever, that seat itself is worth a certain number of sales just in and of itself, right? So you don't necessarily need to be the greatest salesperson in the world. And your product is, in general, well-known. And even if you're working in a new product area – it's just a derivative, and in some cases, it's a deliberate derivative of a product that's already well known. But if you're like in Anna's case, right, or in Jacob's case, you're out selling a business that didn't exist before at all. So you need to sell on multiple levels. One, trust my company. Mm. Just trust my company. Even if the product is well understood, trust the fact that my company can actually do that. And I'm the faith of the company. I've got to be an amazing salesperson. Yeah. Literally just to be able to get in the door, right? And again, this gets back to what you were talking about before. You know, everybody's picture of sales is like, what was that movie? Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. It's just like hard sell tactics, selling people stuff they don't need, all this kind of boiler stuff. Room, and that's not really yeah. true. Yeah, boiler room stuff. And that's not really true. All of these businesses, if you look at what all of them do, these are things that people really want. It's just what's the channel? How do I get to those things, right? Mm. And and for someone to have that sales skill, I think, is is really important. And I'm not sure that it like it's trainable at some level, but I also think it's personality-based, right? I mean, yeah. you can train some people, and they'll never be able to sell anything at all, yeah? I still have an image of a monkey sitting in a seat in Goldman Sachs. You put it in my head. He's probably making <laughs> a, shit, a shit ton yeah. of money as well. <clears throat> Well, I think the Wall Street Journal well, reported. The Wall Street Journal <laughs> reported he's making an average of eight hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars a year. But I'm not. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> you know, that's just the average. So if the monkey can do it, I'm pretty sure that anybody else can do it. The monkey's doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, we've done the sales. Let's talk about Bart. I thought he was a fascinating story because he's just, again, it, it's a different version it's a different incarnation of the, the entrepreneurial spirit isn't it it's about what you have to lose as well what was you interviewed bart what did you get from that story well i mean so bart is trying to reinvent a space right he's trying to use all of his years of experience you know working at amadeus and trying to come up with new products when he was there and also trying to mentor and sort of you know, to use the name of his company sort of expedite the growth of these companies by understanding Across the board, right? So Amadeus is a travel company at its core, right? They run, run one of the largest GDSs, so global distribution systems for travel. And for those of you who don't necessarily know what that means, a GDS is what allows you to – an airline or a hotel even uses GDSs, maybe not Amadeus, but they use them to basically place their inventory on them. And that's what allows for all of the booking mechanisms that we completely take for granted today, right? So he did this <clears throat> as a consultant – for 15 or 16 years, working with Amadeus, watching and seeing companies grow, both in building products internally and seeing what helps and hurts a company grow, but also mentoring and helping startup companies that were sort of ancillary to the Amadeus business and see what was helping them grow. And he's taking all of that experience, right? So he's been looking at <clears throat> – 
early stage companies, what makes them grow, he's sort of been, I don't want to call him an entrepreneur in residence, because I think it minimized what he's already accomplished internally. But he looked at what he was doing, and he said, this is perfect for the venture capital business, but I want to build a different venture style business. I want to build a venture builder, but I don't just want to have money. And, you know, he and I spent a lot of time talking about this both online and offline, and I think he would agree with this. And if he doesn't, you know, please feel free, Bart, to jump in and tell me. But, um, you know, money is essentially a commodity. And if you're a great investor, raising money is, is relatively easy. Relatively. I always say relatively, right? And also, if you're a great founder, getting funding is also relatively easy. But what do you do after you get that money? And we can look at plenty of companies in Southeast Asia. We could probably spend hours talking about this, right? Where their end goal is to sort of be congratulated for, you know, pre-Series A, Series A, call it whatever you want. But that's their sort of, that's their benchmark. You know, it's a thumbs up. I raised some money. I must be great. I've right. accomplished kind of what I set out to accomplish. And I think Bart feels like that's a problem. <clears throat> and I don't disagree with him. The reality is that just as a venture capitalist, and I see this sometimes with the companies that I mentor and advise, particularly on the capital raising side, you can raise money from somebody and it can hurt. It can hurt a lot, actually, because if you raise capital from the wrong person, it can actually end up hurting your business as opposed to helping it. So I think what Bart wants to do is take all of that experience. And remember, he's not from Bangkok either. No. Where was he from? Right. Oh, I think he's from Belgium, right? right. So you, you go back. Like a, yeah, it's Bart sounds like a Belgian name, right? Very, very Belgian. Right, but what does that mean? You know, Bart's an adult. Yeah. He's not a 25-year-old kid like I was when I first left home. It just means that he also understands the necessity to leave his comfort zone mm. and to go out and take risk. And sure, it's really easy for a 25-year-old to sit down and have a conversation with his or her parents and say, you know, I'm not attached to anybody. My life is right. really straightforward and very simplistic, and I'm just going to leave my home country, go somewhere else, and try to make a life for myself. And frankly, if it doesn't work out, I can always come home and live with you wise guys, and I'm sure at some level you'll help me out. But, you know, Bart's in a very different situation. It's a different level of risk-taking, right, for a, for a man or a woman, yeah, with a family mm. and with children that are in school. Because now you're talking about a different level of risk-taking, right? It's like your grandfather tells you when you get married, you don't marry one person. You marry an entire family. And I think what Bart's doing is different because he's not just taking risk for himself. Mm-hmm. He's taking risk for his entire family. And that's like a, you know, we'd like to use the phrase doubling down, but he's doubling down or tripling down. So he's taking his whole family and moving them from their comfort zone and moving them all into an uncomfortable zone for all of them, right? And I used right. to, when I moved to, when I moved to Bangkok, it was kind of the same thing, right? right? Like if you live in Japan, you know, and you're with a Japanese person, there's always like 50% of you that can take care of like all the stuff that you may or may not understand. Right, because you know, seventy percent of that's language. What do I ask about? How do I ask that question? Mm. But if you're moving to a country where neither one of you are native, neither one of you are local, it means you're both basically encountering the same problems from a different angle. That in and of itself is difficult. But then you have that on top of the fact of raising money for a fund. Yep. And then, and that's not the end, too, right? The same thing. Raising money for a fund is not the end. The same way getting a Series A investment is not the end. You have to then take that money, invest that money over a five to seven year period of time. So that's like another long term commitment to being in a place that's not your home. And believe me, if you're a venture capitalist or a venture builder, once you take that money, you can't like change your mind in the middle yeah, yeah. and change your investment mandate and say, oh, from now on, I'm going to invest only in Belgian companies. I'm moving home. Like you've committed. Yep. Right. And again, it's doing something outside your comfort zone. And he's also trying to build a different kind of venture business too, right? Because the, most venture capitalists just say, I have $10 million, I'll invest $200,000 in these companies, I'll invest $500,000 in this stage, and if I have any money left over, I'll follow on with the companies that, I'm, that I've invested in that are doing well. And what he's saying is, I'll invest my money, but I'll only invest my money in companies where I think my team, so it's not just him, right? where my team can actually add um, – some sort of consulting in there, whether it's legal consulting, tax consulting, sales consulting, all the things that all companies need, right? How do I hire, hire them? So you don't have to have your own human resources department. How do I get visas? How do I 
use the money? How do I open a bank account? How do I incorporate? All the things the company struggle with, but really don't add any value to the actual company building itself. And I don't mean that in a bad way for what Bart's doing. I just mean providing a platform into which every individual can start up, can plug into because he's already providing all the back end services and then they can build it. So you can see he's doing this at a different scale in an environment where he's not in his comfort zone. I think that is, um, is noble in the context of what we were already talking about with some of these other people, just from a different angle. Yeah, yeah for sure. And if you took any one of those challenges, let's say starting a new business, leaving a job, moving to a new country or moving your family to a new family. country. Yeah. If you took any one of those in their isolation, that would phase most people. And most people would feel that was too much of a challenge to take on. But it seems what's fascinating about these stories, isn't it, is what makes these people tick that they decide to do all of them together. At the same right? time, all at once. Yeah, what's going on there? What do you think that driver is? It's just risk. It's the ability to take risk. And like you said, you know, life starts when you leave your comfort zone. And I think for all of the people that we've discussed already tonight, and frankly, for a lot of the people that we talk to and about on ATP stories, I think a lot of them fall into this category, right? I mean, you look at how many people have we interviewed so far, 60, 70 people. Yeah. I don't know how many it is. It's a lot, but I think all of them are trying to fall into this sort of outlier category of I can do the regular thing or I can go out and take a risk and I'm happy to fail. And I'm not I'm most comfortable when I'm the most uncomfortable, really, for lack of a better term. And I think that's the way Bart feels. And I think that's the way most of these people feel because that's where the biggest bang for the buck is, too. If you succeed in a place where you're really uncomfortable, then you've succeeded writ large. And I think yeah. that that's one of the things that all these people can agree with. Yeah. Yeah. I want to throw in a Seth Godin quote here, Michael. Just thought it would be Please. useful to give a bit of a, a background to these stories. It's, um, Seth Godin talks a lot about you know, change. And he talks a lot about, in, you know, adopting the entrepreneur's mindset and not being afraid of making mistakes. And I think this, you know, especially when you think about Bart's story as well, I think this quote works quite nicely here. He says, <clears throat> Seth Godin says, the secret to being wrong isn't to avoid being wrong. The secret is being willing to be wrong. The secret is realizing that wrong isn't fatal. And I think about these stories, I right? That. I you love know, that. Exactly. Being wrong isn't fatal. So, I mean, if you were, you know, if you were to move to a place like Bangkok and it didn't work out, well, okay, right. What's the worst thing? You're not going to die as a result, isn't it? And I think that's the worry that people have that, you know, they're going to take these big decisions and it's all going to go wrong. And they do go wrong. Even like the, the most skilled entrepreneurs end up making big mistakes, right? That happens. That's just part of it, right? Some of them work yep. out, some of them don't. But the point is, is that it isn't fatal. You will bounce back. It will just be a blip in your your trajectory, right? Not the end of the world. So that's always worth remembering. I love that quote. I I, I used to, and I still tell my daughter, right? No individual day is fatal. Right there. You like, go. Don't don't worry about today. Right? You don't want to have a, a lifelong struggle of failure and being wrong. But no individual day is fatal. Exactly. And I think that this quote from Godin really puts that into perspective, right? The secret to being wrong is that wrong isn't fatal. Right. Exactly. And you're right. Once you move to a place, if you if it doesn't work, the world is really big and there's plenty of opportunities everywhere. Just yeah. go find a place where the opportunity is. I will say and you have great stories to tell your grandkids, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, so my, my cut on this is that's in the movie. Right. <laughs> there you go. And it's like I said, that, that's in the movie. Right? Because I just I really think it is in the movie, and the fact is, if you failed at everything else, like doesn't you know we we haven't spoken to him yet, but we will interview a guy named Tim Romero, right? right. And Tim's whole person, his whole persona, his whole public persona is: I tried this and that didn't work, and I tried that and that didn't work, and I keep trying stuff, and most of it doesn't work. But the key is, I keep trying. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's all part of it, isn't it, and that's what people are scared of, isn't it? Making these mistakes, and I think that's when you share these stories. What, I guess what we're trying to do here, Michael, is that we're trying to help people realize through story that that is the case, that failure isn't fatal, that people take risks. Sometimes they don't work. Most of the times they do work out. Otherwise, people wouldn't take them. But to give people examples of how these risks can be taken, right? You can leave a job. You can move a country. You can start a business. These are all risks. 
and you see the people doing this and they give you confidence that that could be something that you could do as well. You know, you, right. can, you can have all the data. I always believe that you can have all the data you want about starting a business or changing job or moving country or whatever, but it's going to be somebody's story at the end of the day that's going to make that change in you personally. Yeah, somebody real, like someone that you can identify with and someone that like feels like they maybe have had the same experience you have. You know, one of the things I wanted to talk about and I forgot and I'm going to get some of the details wrong. So, Jacob, if you're listening, write in and let me know what I'm missing, right? But I think when they were building PlayLab, which, like I said, we used to be called Pocket PlayLab, but when they were building that company in the early days, you know, I, I believe at one point they were trying to raise money. And it, again, I could get some of this wrong, but I think most of it's right. They were traveling to China mm. to be able to either raise funding or meet a potential investor or whatever it was. And you know, it's one of these classic stories where the company was running out of money or the amount of money that they've allocated to build it was just sort of dripping slowly, slowly into nothingness. And this was going to be the one thing that saved them, right? And I believe that they actually got there, but they wouldn't let them in the country or maybe they got to the airport in Bangkok and they wouldn't let them leave the country. But but whatever it was, and you and I know what visas are like because oh, <laughs> yeah. we've done some traveling ourselves. Oh, but yeah. whatever whatever the, the truth was, that they did not get to go meet these potential investors and you know imagine the disappointment because they weren't that old right they're still not that old to be fair but they weren't that old this is five years ago maybe and they really had felt like that this trip was the death or the success of the company was like hanging in the balance and whatever whatever happened after that trip whether it was just the beginning of the success of juice cubes or just made them sort of soldier on but the result of that trip, which they thought was going to be fatal because they actually didn't get to make it, was the linchpin that allowed them to succeed. This is the story that I've been told. And what it meant was that they actually, in the end, didn't need funding. And when they came to get funded a few years later, they didn't need that money either, per se, just the money. But they wanted the expertise and sort of the network help and more, for sure, from the team at Monks Hill Capital, which was their only, I believe, external investors – Mm. And it's just, it's just, it's the perfect example of what um, Seth Godin was saying here, right? They were wrong. The whole concept of the trip to mm. China was wrong. And in the end, it didn't work out, but it wasn't fatal. And I think that's yeah. the key point for that, for that little story that I want to tell earlier, but I kind of left out when we were talking about Jacob and PlayLab. And that was that when you hear that story, and I think about that often, it just means that, you know, again, no individual day is fatal. You try to go out and build these things, and sometimes the, the place where you put the most emphasis, where you think, this is it. If this doesn't happen, we're all going to die. Nobody dies, mm. right? And I think it was – oh, God, I wish I could remember his name. I think it was Jerry Lopez used to surf the pipeline at, in Hawaii, and you know the waves are dangerous. And he used to say, you know, the great thing about surfing those waves is that, uh, is that you could die surfing them. The water is really shallow. The waves are really powerful, and you make a mistake, and you could die. He goes – most guys don't die, but some guys do. But the point, but you have to watch this clip of him talking. He's so nonchalant. And he was one of the greatest pipeline surfers ever, right? I was really into surfing, kind of still am. But I was really into surfing when I was a kid, and I used to watch him do this. And that quote of like, you know, you could die out there, but most guys don't die. Some do. And that's the thing. Some do, but most guys Never don't. Never mind you. Make it <laughs> real. <laughs> But it was weird the way he said, you have to watch the clip. <laughs> Some guys do. But most guys don't. And that's the reality is that every single person who steps into that pipeline on a surfboard yeah. is taking a risk. And all of them are outside of their comfort zone. None of them feel like that's going to be the easiest thing they do today. They all know it's hard. Yeah. But the succeeding at it is so exhilarating and so powerful that they keep doing it. It's the same reason why people go to Tahiti and surf at Chofu. And I know that, that surfing may sound like it has nothing to do with startups when we're talking about, but it actually does. It a because lot, yeah. it's a it actually right? does, because again, it's a challenge. And even for surfers that are great at it, just like for entrepreneurs that are really super, that challenge, that being outside your comfort zone is what really matters. And maybe we end with this, right? Unless you have more you want to talk about. But even a guy like Elon Musk says, you know, you'll never understand, right? So he tries to do this space stuff, tries to land a rocket, make a rocket really reusable. Mm. And the first few times he's tried to do it, you know, the rocket's exploded on its way down. It just hasn't landed properly. Now he's landed one, I believe now, or two of them. And that's exhilarating. But he says, you know, all the stories that are written about me are just how like amazing I am and how I'm just filled with success. He goes, but every time you fail, nobody understands the level of depression that's associated with it. But I'm going to continue to go outside my comfort zone 
to try to build big things. And I think that that's actually really important. And I think that's what everybody we're talking to here is trying to do as well. Yeah. So we've shared four stories today from ATP stories. We had uh, Marty Roberts, Jacob Likagard, Anna Gong, and Bart Bellas. And we'll put all the details in the show notes so you can go and check out those stories. Let us know what you think of these stories and whether or not, whether or not they resonated with you. And it'd be great to hear your feedback on those four stories. If there's anything in the stories that stood out for you that made you think or an aha moment or something that you think, yeah, that's exactly what I've done or what I want to do. You can hashtag or you know, you can hit us up on Twitter at Asia Tech Pod. You can find us on Facebook, Asia Tech Podcast, facebook.com slash Asia Tech Podcast, or check out our website, www.asiatechpodcast.com, sign up for our newsletter, and get one of these every week where we, we deliver the most exciting stories in the Asian tech ecosystem. Michael, this was a new format this week. Are you happy with it? I am super happy. And I just keep thinking, like, we, we touched on four people, but we could have touched on 40 Wow. Um, and there's more, and more than 40. There's more. There. Way more than I was going to say. <laughs> that Our goal be. was 100, right? And we booked in 111. Over the we'll last do more than 100. Of... Yeah. Yeah. There's I just... mean, if, we do, if we're doing 20-something a week, I think uh, we'll get to 100 relatively quickly. So it's only dependent upon us. The demand is there, I think. So anyway, t- today I thought was great. And I think it's good to be reflective sometimes, to yeah. look back on, on why these stories are important in the context of Asia tech in the Asia Tech podcast, and um, I think that today was actually quite enlightening for me just to sit and think about why these people do what they do and how they do it. Love it, and we—I feel privileged as well. I know privilege is an overused word in in the context of nah. life and career, but I really do that. You know, we can actually just sit and talk to these people because, you know, being—I think this is a key point, isn't it? You mentioned it earlier, Michael. Being an entrepreneur can sometimes be a lonely job. Yeah, and to be able to share that story with other people is just fantastic that's what it's about at the end of the day it really is you've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com